Hello, my friends. Welcome to Let's Be Real episode four. I am so excited for this episode. I just wrapped up an incredible interview with Andy Kolber, who wrote this book called Try Softer. And Andy just feels like a kindred spirit to me. She's like a more artistic, creative, (laughs) big little sister friend. And we just had an incredible conversation about trauma, what trauma is, how we all handle um, coping in this pandemic right now, what our window of tolerance is, what that even means and how we know we're in it, what do we do when we're outside of it. And Andi even gave me some free counseling. I asked her for some help with something that I've been feeling and going through. And it really was a really powerful experience. So I'm really glad to share her with you, to share this episode with you. Please pass it along to someone that might find it helpful. All the information about Andi, you need to follow her on Instagram, Facebook, everywhere. Get her book. We will leave you the link in the show notes. Would love for you to check her out and cheer her on. I know this is going to be helpful to you as it's been so helpful to me. Here we go. This is episode four with Andi Kolber. Welcome to Let's Be Real, a completely honest, entirely practical conversation about how to live our lives with freedom, purpose, and abundance. Popular author and communicator Nicole Eunice brings her 20 years of experience as a counselor, pastor, and coach to a real conversation about the tricky questions and tough decisions in life and how to find clarity in action no matter what obstacle you may face. Have a topic to suggest or a tricky situation you need help with? We'd love to hear from you. Send us an email or voice memo to Nicole at NicoleEunice.com where we might feature you on the show. And now here's your host, Nicole Eunice. Awesome. Well, Andy, thank you so much for joining us today on Let's Be Real. I mean, if you are not a real person, I don't know who is. I have loved getting to know you. For those of you guys who are listening and meeting Andi for the first time, she is a therapist. She's a beautiful writer. She resides in Colorado with her husband and two boys. No, boy and girl? Boy and a girl. Yep. Boy and a girl. And how old are they? My daughter is eight and my son is three. Okay. And give us a snapshot since we're all here in our stay at home life of what like an hour in your life has looked like today. Oh, wow. It, it's like so up and down. Um, I, okay. One minute, Jude, my three-year-old is like clinging to my leg and mommy, you're really warm and you're a nice mommy. Also, can you get me cereal? And then my daughter's like, let's play the new Trolls music. And then we're like, okay, let's look at what, you know, online distance learning school is for today. And then I'm like, okay, let me think about if I need to get back to any clients. What is there? Who do I need to respond to? Um, it feels like there's just about a, a lot of different things intersecting for sure. Yes. Oh my goodness. Well, I can't wait to hear more about how you're coaching and really counseling yourself through this time because of your experience. So Andi is a trauma-informed counselor, right? Is that Would that be accurate that that's sort of the the direction of your practice? Yeah, so I am a licensed professional counselor in Castle Rock, Colorado, and I I often identify myself as trauma-informed. And what I mean by that is essentially um, the understanding and the realization that all of us are complex and that our stories are, are literally held in our body. Mm -hmm. And they affect our nervous system and they affect how we show up in the world. And whether that be at church or our homes or, you know, right now, a lot of it's just at home. But, but, you know, like no matter what we're doing in our life, like we don't contain, we don't leave ourselves when we're in different situations. And so a trauma-informed perspective recognizes um, how our bodies are affected by trauma and by nervous system states. And even the ways that um, relationships and systems affect um, our ability to sort of show up in the world in the way that is most true to who we really are. Mm. Obviously, you have a really meaningful private practice with your clients. What came along that brought you to this place where your, your ministry and your platform has grown to include Try Softer, the book that you've released? Yeah. So it's such a funny thing because I think for a long time, 
I had this sense where I just sort of wanted to do my thing kind of quietly. Mm. <laughs> I, um, you know, ironically, because I'm a very passionate person, but it's sort of like, I just didn't want to make waves. Mm. I just wanted to do my thing. I just wanted to have my little family and sort of in many ways, I just wanted to be safe. Mm. And I know that I think a lot of times safety gets a bad rap. Um, but for me, I grew up in a childhood where I experienced complex relational trauma. And so the way that I coped with that actually was by white knuckling my way in the world. And how that often looked was by needing to be, um, partly it was that I needed to be the best at everything. I have a, I'm a four with a, with a strong three wing. And so I navigated the world by, um, by creating armor that allowed me to feel at least somewhat safe because if I, um, by this strength that I sort of was able to, to, to be like, if I can just be the best, then people sort of can't hurt me. Mm -hmm. Um, even if I didn't feel like I didn't belong, even when I felt alone, even when I felt exhausted and scared, um, and it's not that that's the only way that I showed up, I, but it's like that was the, one of the primary ways. Well, and and I so think that's, over time, as I, I think that's one of those places where you and I resonate because in The Struggle is Real, I talk about that same underlying belief system that if I can do things perfectly, then I can't get hurt. And I'd love for you, first of all, you mentioned the Enneagram. So any of our listeners who are not familiar with the Enneagram, we may talk about that in a later show. You can let me know if you want to hear more about that. But Andi was identifying herself with a type on the Enneagram and her and I have very similar kind of grouping. So maybe that's a place that I think many of us resonate. But you mentioned uh, complex relational trauma. And could you say more, like, can you give everyone a little bit more? Because I think that when people hear that, it sparks for them, them and they wonder, is that what I ex experience? What is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I mean when I say that is that, so I'll step back and just define trauma in general. And what I mean when I say that is that we can experience both big T and little t trauma. And that is anything that overwhelms our nervous system's mm -hmm. capacity to cope. And so big T trauma, um, the, the reason I define it that way is because, especially in what's called the DSM, which is just something that, uh, you know, psychologists, counselors, we use to diagnose more specifically post-traumatic stress disorder. This is big T trauma. And that typically are things like sexual violence, um, observing someone um, who may lose their life, also being a person who is threatened with losing their life. It could be huge nat natural disasters. Um, and so with that, there's, you know, there are some specific diagnostic that goes along with it that, that makes it PTSD. But at its core, it's anything that overwhelms our nervous system's ability to cope. How and so you know? essentially, how do you how would we know? know? How do you know your nervous system's been overwhelmed? Yeah. So with that, essentially, well, let me do this. Let me say little t trauma, and then I'm going to go into how you'll know. Great. Because okay, I think cool. it'll, make, it'll make sense. Um, so little t trauma is basically anything almost other than big T trauma where you feel overwhelmed. And so for me, in that, that question of, for, I experienced chronic and compound um, little t traumas within the relational structure of my family, meaning my as a child, we are actually wired to need our caregivers. Mm -hmm. um, one of my parents, well, actually both parents struggled with addiction. One parent um, had really severe mental health issues that were um, not treated and who was unwilling to, to get help. Um, so there were lots of dynamics that made my home um, in many ways viscerally, like emotionally unsafe. Mm. So that's little t trauma. And so that is actually, so I say I'm a survivor of CPTS, CPTSD. And basically the reason that matters is lots of chronic little t trauma can act on our body in the same way mm. as big t trauma. 
And this is really important because what we're really getting to with any trauma conversation is that it's the way a person experiences the situation that matters the most. What might be traumatic to one person may not be as severe to another person for lots of reasons. Maybe they have different types of support. Maybe they have um, had certain types of um, better ways to debrief and handle. There's, there's so much there. But so when you, when you ask a question, how do you know you're overwhelmed? A really important part of this is essentially that when our body um, is experiencing something that we perceive to be a threat. Now, what's important here is it's all about perception. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not so much what's actually happening, although obviously that matters. It's the way our body experiences it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So to, like, let's say you're a child and you're in a cold room for hours and hours by yourself you're going to maybe experience that very differently than an adult. Mm -hmm. So when something starts to overwhelm our nervous system, we go outside of what's called our window of tolerance. Mm. The window of tolerance is the range in which we can stay with and feel our feelings in a way that is tolerable. Mm -hmm. But once we go outside of it, we, go, we begin to first go into fight or flight. Mm -hmm. Or if that doesn't resolve the threat, we then go into dissociation, mm -hmm. which is really common with especially childhood trauma. Because as a kid, who are you going to fight? Like, who are you capable of fighting necessarily to get you out of the threat? And where are you going to run away to? Right. right. And, and we know that like dissociation, for those who have not heard that term before, is this powerful, I mean, very, very effective, really coping mechanism that involves really leaving your body. I like to describe it for people as if you've ever been driving and you don't know where you were, like you drove to work and you don't have a memory of really driving to work, your body's done that in a tiny way. And for those who have had that experience, dissociation then gives you this way of leaving your body. Because like you said, as a child, you can't you can't protect yourself necessarily from those feelings. You can't leave. So this is something that's been wired into us that is a coping mechanism that then stops serving us the same way if we mm -hmm. find ourselves going to it again and again, especially as adults. Yeah. So what can happen is for especially, so this is, you know, I always like to frame this and I love how you're talking about that because I hear that a lot of grace. I find, especially in Christian setting sometimes there's a lot of shame hmm. that gets attached to the way our body is truly wired to handle threat hmm. and i like to reframe this through the lens that god gave us this like hmm. if you are about to get hit by a car you actually want your body to go into flight you need to move out of the way and when that happens the top of our brain our prefrontal cortex, which is really important. And we may talk about that more, but it actually goes offline. Mm. And that's the same. That's true with dissociation. And so what that means is, is that our body is essentially working for our good because it's saying something feels really unsafe and I'm going to do everything possible to keep you safe. Mm. And, and I really believe that's a gift from God. Yeah. And what can happen, though, is that when we have lots of trauma, whether it's big T trauma or little t trauma, that's unresolved, our window of tolerance actually shrinks. Mm. And we can often perceive things that are not a threat as though they are. Mm -hmm. And so when you say, like, for example, with dissociation, you know, like if you grew up in a home with lots of relational trauma and you begin to have an issue with your spouse, your body might begin to perceive, man, this is threatening because there's conflict. And my body thinks that conflict is automatically dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so you may find yourself getting foggy, feeling like I like what you're saying, like outside of your body. And this is because our body is saying, this is, this is how I know how to protect you. And until we have a better way, we will continue on that road. And, and so I think there's just a lot of room for compassion. 
Yeah. I love that, Andy. And I love the words that you're putting around this. And I just want to encourage our viewers, listeners right now that this is a safe place to think about this. I think sometimes, especially for those who've had those complex compounding little T traumas, there's almost like not space to allow yourself to see that as an actual unresolved issue. And, but so, so you might, you might sort of engage in this conversation all along different places. Maybe you're not processing unresolved trauma or know that you are, but you are getting foggy when you get into a conflict with your spouse or you feel this like sense of dread in your stomach when your boss calls you to his office and you don't know why your brain basically stops working. I love the phrase phrase, go offline because if you're a really, let's say, thoughtful leader or whatever, you don't, it it doesn't make any sense to you that things are now going offline in certain certain situations. So being able to be in a safe place to actually like talk about that and be like, oh, is that what's happening with me? Tell us more about the window of tolerance. Like how do we know that we're in it? How do we know we're in the place that we do feel? Yeah, yep. Yeah. And I think, so I'll just say that this is a really, like, if this is the first time your listeners have heard this term um, or these concepts, I just want to encourage you to be really kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. Because when we begin to dive into this thing that is totally new, um, it's actually really common to want to just be like, I need all the answers right now. And like, give me my three steps because I want to be fixed and I just want to do these things. So I just want to off the bat, like at the beginning, really acknowledge that that's so common. That's why like in my book, Try Softer, um, I, the first chapter I start out with is how long will it take? <laughs> because I can't tell you how many times I've had the conversation with folks and honestly with myself um, of, so how long is this going to, like, when are we done? And so actually I want to change the posture of like, this is a different way to be even engaging and understanding that we have this window in which we're really our full self. That's how I talk about it a lot. Like when our prefrontal cortex is online, what it means is that our full brain Mm -hmm. is available to us. Our, all of the information that our body has to give us is available to us when we are in our window of tolerance. And sometimes when we've lived and in like decades by often getting outside of our window of tolerance, we may not really completely yet know how it feels Mm. to, to live from that place. And so I think these are important things to keep in mind because Um, like for example, because our body is so, it's adaptive, it's brilliant. Our bodies are so elegant in the ways that they learn to keep us safe. And so for example, if you grew up in a home where you were shamed for having feelings, it may become, have become a coping strategy to be cognitive about everything as though We can just think ourselves out of any problem. And we partly do that because we're actually trying to distance ourselves. We're trying to lean on our left side of our brain so we cannot touch the pain that maybe is being held um, on our right side of our brain, which is where most of our emotions and where we're really connected to our bodies. So all that to say, we, a lot of times the way that we know that we're in our window of tolerance is that there are some really specific things that come with that. One, um, we tend to be pro-social. Mm. So we are more open and able to really connect with other people when we're in our window of tolerance. And, and there's a really good reason for this. Because once we go out of our window, our brain is really down into the survival mode. And survival doesn't care about nuance. Survival cares about what's going to keep me safe. And so I am, all of us are more likely to see other people as a threat when we go outside of our window. And so like, that's a great clue. Like if you find yourself irritable and just like angsty and like, um, you know, like why is this person trying to, you know, mess with me? Maybe you're not fully outside of that window, but maybe you're on your way. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the ways that I always, when we get that information is like, wow, my body's trying to tell me something. Mm-hmm. 
there's some information coming up that my body's trying to express that something's coming up. Um, an, another indicator is that we're able to be more creative. Mm -hmm. We tend to have this ability to think bigger and more clearly. Um, you know, with my kiddos, we say we actually need to calm our feeling. Like we have to kind of get our feelings back, you know, to a place where we're feeling calm before we can solve problems. And again, the reason is, is because our top of our brain isn't online when we're outside of our window. So when we feel a sense of like clarity and like, oh, I, I think I could see this from a different perspective, um, that's a really good sign. Um, another thing that I think often is an indicator that we're in our window is that we're actually like quite literally physiologically connected to our heart. Mm -hmm. Meaning that like we can sort of have, we, we notice the information that our heart also brings in, like mm -hmm. compassion and love and, and even passion of like what we care about. And so, you know, I think that there just tends to be, um, there's a sense, like it's interesting sometimes when I hear my clients talk about it, they say, oh, I haven't been in this place very much, but when I'm here, I can tell that it's like, here I am, like, here's the me who has access to the sort of wisdom. And I really believe that's oftentimes the place where we really often connect with what God has um, made available to us. Mm. Like that's when we're most able to connect with that. Well, are you guys in, are you under shelter in place orders right now? Uh, we are. Yeah. And how long have you been home? Do you know how Gosh. long? Been? So we've been living from that place for like a month. Yeah. But I think the actual has been about two weeks. If I, honestly, I'm kind of lost track. <laughs> but <laughs> <Haven't> we all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's been about two weeks of like the technical order, but we were practicing pretty significant social distancing for at least a month. Okay. So at the time of this airing, it'll be, you know, a few weeks more and who knows if we'll still be under these orders or not, but we're in this really unique time, which is one of the reasons that I was hoping we could have you on the show in that everyone is experiencing a collective circumstance that does lend itself to either triggering previous experiences that you've had in life or for the first time, maybe bringing up some of these ways that you may, we may have all left our window of tolerance, let's say, and not be able to control that. And I know that in your book, you give these practices for how to engage with yourself to stay grounded and come back to that window. Which of those would you say has been most meaningful for you in this last few weeks? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so one, one of the things that I say a lot is that the harder the season, the gentler we must become. Mm. And man, I can't think of a time <laughs> when we need to maybe be as, as gentle collectively mm. as we need to be now. And so I say that because I think it's also an indicator that um, I think sometimes we in, in our culture can think of self-care like a checklist or like one and done. Mm. Like I, there's the thing that like the one thing that I do and that's it. And I try to really think of it more like, um, especially in this season, like layers, mm. almost like it's a, it's like a supportive, um, like bubble wrap <laughs> almost <laughs> like I'm like the, like things are so hard that one tiny little layer of bubble wrap might not be enough. So, so I need a lot of bubble wrap right now to, to help to, um, allow me to be in my window of tolerance, to be most, um, who I am. Hmm. And so for me, a lot of times when I think about this, you know, and, and trace after one of the phrases that I use simultaneously with the phrase trace after is compassionate attention. Mm. And, and what I mean by that is just this idea that again, when our, when we're, when our whole brain's online, we have the ability to think about thinking, mm -hmm. meaning I can observe what's going on with myself um, when I'm in my window of tolerance or when I'm even nearing the, the limits or the edges of it. And this is 
this is something I'm going to be doing my whole life. Like I say, I don't, I'm never going to graduate from trying softer. For me, this is what it means to be a person. This is what I think even Jesus, I believe, meant by, in some ways, abundant life. Mm -hmm. Like there's this sense in which we are invited to this place where we can be gentle and compassionate because this is how God is with us and we get to steward it. And so for me, that, that lens often is the indicator of like, okay, what's, where do I go? What do I need? And almost always the starting place is that I have to get what I, well, and other folks use this phrase too, but I have to get grounded Mm -hmm. and, and grounding for me. And and I know you're familiar with this too, but um, there's a lot of ways to get grounded. Grounding really is just about using our senses Mm -hmm. to bring ourselves back into the immediate moment. And that really serves to bring us back to our window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. And so like for me, a lot of times it's really focusing on truly like honing in to the moment and using five senses without judgment. This is a really important key because if you pick up your cup and you're like, oh, this cup is so dirty. (laughs) Like, it's not going to be helpful, you know? Um, And so for me, a lot of, like, I would say the number one thing is going outside Mm. and feeling my feet like on the ground and noticing like, what does the air smell like? And what am I hearing? And, you know, sometimes like when it's been sunny, it's like, I'll even put my just bare feet like in the grass Mm -hmm. and notice what that's like for me. Um, and, and really, I mean, even beyond grounding, we have a lot of information that tells us that being in nature, it, if, if at all possible, cause I know it's more complicated right now, um, is really soothing to our mm-hmm. nervous system. Mm-hmm. And so typically for me, a lot of it comes through the lens of doing grounding outside movement. Um, I, I do a lot of walks. Um, I listen to a lot of worship music mm-hmm. or I'll do, um, some self guide, like some, um, what's called guided meditations mm-hmm. around self compassion. Um, and so I tend to layer those things mm-hmm. because, you know, I might do them even like three times a day if I can. Um, just because again, it's, it's less of a like, oop, I checked this off and now I'm done. And it's more of a like, I'm tracking with my body. I'm tracking with my nervous system. And some days have been really hard, mm. like really hard. Like I've been doing this work for at least 10 years and I'm over here like, oh, thank you, Lord. We made it through the day, you know? And so, yeah, if folks are listening to this now and you're really struggling, I um, just want to encourage you that that's okay. Um, this is a really... This is an unprecedented and and very hard time. Yeah. Okay. Well, Andi, I'm going to have you put on your counseling hat as you already, it's, our, it's always on. I know it's a state of being, but here, I'm going to give you an example of something that I am sort of experiencing right now and ask you to, to lead me through it. So mm-hmm. getting grounded, sort of finding again, my center, especially as a three on the Enneagram that likes to live in the future and use future successes as a way to cope with the present. Mm -hmm. And so something last night, I was finally kind of getting back to myself. And in that, I felt a real powerful wave of fear, Mm -hmm. insecurity, like, oh my gosh, I'm so disappointed right now. I'm not sure about what's going to happen next. All of that. And then it's kind of like you get into your present and then you're assaulted by all of these feelings, which I think you probably can relate to um, as well in your, in your work and just maybe personally. What's your next step after that when you said, okay, I want to be present, but actually when I get present, I'm now feeling lots of powerfully neg- like hard uh, emotions to process. Help, help yeah. me and help our listeners when you're in that place. Yeah. So the first thing, like if we were in my office, I would ask you, where are you noticing that in your body? My stomach, I would say right now. Okay. I just brought it all back so I could be here with you. Yeah. Okay. So like, okay. I feel sort of like tense in my core when I, okay. when I put those emotions into my mind. Okay. 
And, and I just want to acknowledge, do you feel like you can stay with this? Can you stay with this in a way that, not that it's easy, but that you're with yourself? Like you're in your window of tolerance, even though it's difficult. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's Only really because important. I've done this for a long time. If you can't, yeah. that's okay. But I feel like I right. can. Yes. Stay that's with exactly yourself. right. Yeah. Because if your answer was, I can't, mm-hmm. we would actually go back to grounding mm-hmm. and then we would do more resourcing activities mm-hmm. um, to help you to get space. Mm-hmm. Because if we can't stay in our window of tolerance, it is actually not helpful for you to do this act- next activity. Mm-hmm. So, but because you can stay with it, and you're noticing that in your stomach, I just want to invite you to take a hand or a two hands if you feel comfortable doing this and actually placing them where you're feeling that in your stomach. Okay. So now I just want to invite you to just really settle into this, to your chair and what you're noticing in your stomach. Mm. And I just want you to notice if if that brings any comfort to, to push, to put your hand there, to support yourself in that way. Mm -hmm. It does. Okay. It does. Okay, good. And now I just want to ask you, like, as you're feeling that in your stomach, I'm wondering if you could invite yourself um, to give that sensation a name. Like, is there an emotion that, that, um, that would, you know, describe what you're experiencing in your stomach. Yes, I would say it's anxious. It's anxious, okay. Yeah, which is funny because anxious is a very hard emotion for me to access. So, Mm. you know, it's, it's, I've been saying and have just been trying to also do for myself the opportunity that we have in this moment of disequilibration, like just everything, you can actually become more of yourself. And I am learning that I am more anxious than I think that I am. And Mm -hmm. that means I have to learn what to do, how to cope with that. And to um, now I'm going to (laughs) cry, how to be, you know, I love it. How do you try softer? How do you actually say when things get harder, we want to be more gentle? That's really helpful. And I'm sure we're not done, but. (laughs) No, it's okay. I I really appreciate you sharing that. And so I think there's a couple ways that we could work with what you're feeling here. And, And one of the ways that is just really in some ways simple, but I think can be powerful is just to notice If as you are honing in on that sensation and where you're feeling that Mm -hmm. in your stomach, um, is there, is there a color that you could put to that sensation that you're experiencing? Mm -hmm. Maybe gray. Gray. Okay. And is there a size? Hmm. Mm, I can't get that. It's okay. Is there a shape? Hmm. Round. Round. Okay. What I want you to do is you're just noticing this anxious, gray, round um, sensation that you're having. I want you to take a moment and I just want you to see if you can sort of really focus on it and see if, if there's a... A, if you can lean into it, I want you to see if there's a peak mm-hmm. to that, sort of like a wave, mm-hmm. and then allowing it to move through. Does mm. that make sense? It does. So almost like moment. in my imagination, as if it comes in. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. And even as you know, as you were talking just a moment ago, mm-hmm. I noticed how you got some emotion that mm-hmm. came up, and you may even just go back to what was coming up for you there. That just leaning into, you were saying um, that that you don't often access this anxiety, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you're giving yourself permission to do that. So I wonder if you could just lean into that for a moment and notice. When I do that, it feels like it gives something that feels stuck and bigger 
um, it makes it feel more dynamic. I love the word wave because it's like participating in a moving experience rather than like, oh my gosh, I'm going to look at this thing and it's going to overwhelm me. It's going to overtake me. It's more like, no, I can, I can roll, let it roll around, like roll on and through Mm -hmm. and it's not gone, but it's not stuck or like, it's going to be a destination that has no other, this only place you can live is now in this like hard, powerful experience or or maybe even, um, unfamiliar. I think maybe that's the the word is when it feels unfamiliar, it doesn't feel like something that's going to come and go, but rather like something you're going to get there and never be able to leave again. Mm. So that imagery is really, really helpful. Mm. So I want you to just take a moment now and I just want you to, you know, maybe even do like a body scan. Mm-hmm. So like almost like a laser is going over your body. Just want you to notice if there's any change, if there's, if anything feels different, what's coming up for you as you mm. do that? Yeah, I feel rela- like I feel like that exact feeling is not there right now. But I also feel like when it is there, I know what to do with it in some ways. Like rather than thinking, oh my gosh, when I get close to that or when I feel myself sort of tensing up, I've got to distract and do something else. Instead, it's almost like, oh, you can let yourself feel it, name it, color it, shape it, and see it as a wave rather than as this like scary, like new destination that you're going to get trapped, that I'm going to get trapped in. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, I think that this work is people are at so many different places. Like sometimes, Mm -hmm. like you said, you've been doing this for a long time and, and sometimes it can take it can take some time to get to the point where we can actually feel the feeling. Mm. But really, this is the goal. Like even when I do, I practice something called EMDR, which Mm. is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. And essentially that's a, that's a, it's a therapeutic modality that helps people move through trauma Mm -hmm. and and reprocess trauma. Mm. But what's so fascinating about all this work and why I love it and why I think that there's so many layers to it is that it kind of always comes back to the capacity that God already gave us, which is that we are made to be with ourselves and to move through. Like our body is wired to heal. Mm. Like that is, I mean, it it just, it like literally brings a tear to my eye because it's Mm. so beautiful. Yeah. And really that's what emotions are for. Emotions give us information. And if we can, if we can compassionately observe them and give them what they need to actually move through our body, Mm. what we're doing is we're allowing the process to complete itself. Mm. Now, sure. There's nuance with that. Sometimes when an emotion comes up, we might be like, oh, now I know what I think I need to do next. Or sometimes it's just like, okay, now I'm feeling better and I'm going to go on with my day. There's no like, this is your one checklist of everything that's ever happened with an emotion. It's like, we are these dynamic individuals that have our system, that God gave us the capacity to listen to the system. Mm. And so, so this work is really so beautiful in the sense that we're just able to, this is the work of compassionate attention. Mm. Um, is and I love it, you know, I mean, what I love about that and even just that, that small exercise, grounding, can you stay with an emotion? Can you let it roll through or return to grounding? Is it doesn't require all the things that we often think self-care means. It doesn't require you go to a yoga studio. It doesn't mean that you have to go get a massage. It doesn't mean you have to go get with your girlfriends. Because a lot of us, we have those coping mechanisms that we've had to you that we've been using. And we're all in a season where you can't use those. You actually have to let your body be the one who is who is leading and healing and processing rather than maybe some external things, which are are not bad in of themselves. They're okay. wonderful. But if we need more than one thin bubble wrap, you know, Mm -hmm. and you used to use those other things as your extra wrap, this Mm -hmm. is a way to right where you are, right in the life that you're in, to actually um, let yourself come back into yourself without some of those extraneous coping mechanisms in a time where we need it more than ever. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're so right. Like yoga is great. Connection with your friends is great. Those are all great. 
And, <laughs> and um, what many of us were not really given. And I say this, and I think this is part of, you know, one of your first questions to me is like, what led me to want to write a book mm-hmm. about this? Mm-hmm. What I saw is that even folks who had not had the type of trauma that I had experienced really struggled with many of these things. And so what I saw is that we were missing these links. Mm -hmm. Like like systemically we're missing this. We're not, we don't have great language. And and I think this is, you know, this is true in the church. Yeah. This is also true in culture. Like we don't have great language to help people understand this emotional regulation. This, this comes out of attachment research. This Mm -hmm. comes out of uh, interpersonal neurobiology. It comes out of somatic psychology. And what we're seeing is profound, like how it allows us to really be alive and to heal. Yeah. And so for me, I just saw this gap because as a person who had experienced so much trauma, it was like, I, I felt like someone gave me, I don't know. I was like, why is nobody talking? Like, I shouldn't <laughs> say that. It's not that nobody was talking about it. It's that it was not, it's not a wide, it's not widely known. And it's also not, it, it also has been regulated to this like big tr- big T trauma subset. And so yes. what I've experienced in ministry is so many people who have all the signs that they need grounding and processing and have unreconciled emotions. I wrote in the, in the struggle is real. It, it's exactly what you said, Andy. It's not the moment. It's the memory of the moment that matters. Mm-hmm. And we can be in the same moment and have a completely different interpretation of that memory. And I was seeing the same thing where I'm like, I've experienced this healing personally. Um, I've seen it be helpful to people professionally. But then there's this massive group of people who think that they don't like qualify somehow for um, Uh (laughs) emotional language, the ability to listen to your own body and emotions to understand what your yourself is is saying to you about who your true self is and i for one am so so glad that you wrote this book i actually have it here if you guys want to see it this is try softer this is a great time for this book um that little exercise that andy and i spent time on of course i get um to be personally benefit from that but that kind of stuff is what's in this book and i find it so helpful so even if you're not or don't think that you need counseling, or you're not in that place, or you're just starting, like you said, Andi, maybe someone's listening is like, shoot, how long is it going to (laughs) take? This is a great place to start, Mm -hmm. is just to familiarize yourself with what's out there and what's been so helpful and healing to so many people. And I'm grateful to you, Andi, for all the work that you've done in that area. It means a lot. Mm, Well, thank you. And thank you for endorsing the book. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your work. I think, you know, obviously there's, I think there's a shift happening Mm -hmm. in in the church and and in culture. And that just makes me so excited. I'm so grateful to get to be a a little part of that, you know, and I think, I think what we're seeing in many ways that there's a fruition of a lot of trauma that has not been healed. (laughs) Yeah. And that is why there's a return to the body. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think this is not new because, you know, Jesus, Jesus gave us the best example of what it means to live fully human in mm. a body, to not be disconnected, to not shame ourselves, but to really honor the humanity. Um, and so it's, it really makes me so excited mm. to see some of the work that's being done, some of the seeds that are being planted, some of the ways people are moving towards their own healing and their own emotional health. And I just want to encourage your listeners, like I, ex- I totally agree with you in the sense of so much of the reason I wrote this book, it's like it was it's for folks who experienced trauma and it is very much for the folks who would never consider themselves survivors of trauma. Like my hope was to write a book that says, this is about what it means to be human. This is what it means to live in a body. Yeah. This is what it means to exist in a world that's imperfect. Mm. And, and so it's for every, and so it's for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And we've got your, where you can find Andy is in the show notes, links to the book. So you can buy them. You can catch all that either right here on YouTube or on the podcast. Andy, thank you so much for bringing your beautiful spirit, your compassion 
and your creativity to bear in your book and for the show. It's been awesome to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to Let's Be Real with Nicole Eunice. We'd love to hear from you. Have a topic to suggest or a tricky situation you need help with? Send us an email or a voice memo to Nicole at NicoleEunice.com that we may feature you on the show. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode.